All right, welcome back to the listener's commentary on the book of Hebrews. In this recording, we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 18. In the preceding section, Hebrews 2, 1 through 4, there was that moment of exhortation, the first exhortation that we saw here in the book of Hebrews. After that now, beginning here in 2, 5 through 18, the author resumes his exposition of the Son in relationship to angels. So in chapter 1, 5 through 14, the author cited seven Old Testament passages which show the Son's superiority to angels. Then in 2, 1 through 4, there was that first exhortation based on that calling the original readers and by extension us to remain faithful to Jesus. Now here, picking up in chapter 2, verses 5 and following, he begins with angels again. In fact, in the Greek text, verse 5 reads like this, for not to angels. It's the third word. Angels is the third word in the Greek text because it's the key linking term with the preceding explanation in chapter 1, 5 through 14. So here in this section, we pick up the explanation again to deal with this particular underlying question of the Son in relationship to angels. The question is, if the Son is so superior to angels, why does he look so weak instead of glorious? And the answer? Well, the answer is because the Son had to become human in order to die for sins. That's the whole point of this section. The Son is the exalted Lord of the universe, but the Son had to lower himself for a time to deal with human sin, and that meant he had to become human. So here, in this section, we move from just introducing the Son to the Son become human. And not just become human, specifically become human so that he could die. In fact, in this section of Hebrews 2, 5 through 18, the author uses the name Jesus for the first time here because that's the son's human name. He becomes human so that he can deal with human fallenness and thus restore humans to their intended position. So the structure or flow of this particular passage is verses 5 through 8 is about human beings in general. And we actually need to make sure we don't miss that. So verses 5 through 8 is about human beings in general. It quotes from Psalm 8 about the role and status that humans in general were supposed to have, do have, but it's been kind of compromised a bit and we don't just see their full role yet. So that's 5 through 8. And then in verses 9 through 18, those focus on Jesus and how we may not see humans in that role just yet, but we actually do see Jesus humbled in his incarnation, but exalted in his exaltation. And so 5 through 8, humans in general, 9 through 18, Jesus in particular. So with that introduction to the context and then the structure of this section, let's jump into Hebrews chapter 2, picking up in verse 5, where it says, For he did not subject the, to angels the world to come about which we are speaking. So angels aren't the ones who are designed to reign over the world to come. And the word translated world here is that same word we saw earlier in Hebrews chapter 1 that refers to the civilized or inhabited earth as opposed to the uninhabited earth. And the author clarifies that he he specifically has in mind the new earth, the new world or the new inhabited earth that is to come in the future when God restores all things. Well, angels aren't the ones designated to be the rulers over that world to come. Humans are. And Psalm 8 actually suggests that. And so the author here of Hebrews goes on in verses 6 through 8 to quote from Psalm chapter 8. Here's what it says. But someone has testified somewhere saying, he's being kind of generic, we know it's Psalm 8, saying, what is man that you think of him? Or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have put everything in subjection under his feet. Now, Psalm 8 is sort of an interesting psalm because it is about humans in general, and it is about their status and role, and yet the reality is the human role has been somewhat compromised as a result of the fall. 
So the original design for human beings at creation was God overall, humans as God's co-regents, and then the world underneath that. So God, humans, and then the world with the humans reigning over the world in partnership with God on God's behalf. But that intention, that design was ruptured when humans sinned. So Psalm 8 picks up with how things now stand. Humans for a little while lowly, but eventually being crowned with glory and honor in the world to come. That's at least how the author of Hebrews is applying this psalm now and reading the psalm in light of what has happened in Jesus. So the first two lines here of Psalm 8 that the author of Hebrews quotes stand in parallel in typical Hebrew poetry fashion. What is man that you think of him? Or the son of man, that you are concerned about him. What is man? Or what is the son of man? Those two lines are parallel to each other. But because Jesus frequently applied the phrase son of man to himself, we tend to immediately and almost exclusively apply it to him. But the phrase son of man originally just meant human, as in like son of Adam. So in the context of the entire psalm, the first two lines are about human beings in general, and they ask the question, in view of God's majesty, that's how the psalm begins, in view of God's majesty, how is it that he takes thought of human beings? But because it uses the phrase son of man, it does make a natural connection to the son in his incarnation when he became human. And so the next line in the psalm then speaks of what's true of human beings in general and Jesus in particular by becoming human. We have been made for a little while lower than the angels. That's true of humans in general. Someday we'll be exalted over a restored earth. Someday we'll be crowned with glory and honor. In fact, the Apostle Paul actually says that when that day comes, we will actually rule and judge angels. But for the time being, we've been made a little lower than angels. So that's what's true of humans in general. And it's also true of Jesus in particular. By becoming human, he joined us human beings in the lower than angel status for a time. Then the psalm wraps up with who humans are meant to be and who, in the context of Hebrews here, says they will be in the world to come. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have put everything in subjection under his feet. So even though humans have at present been made a little lower than the angels, someday humans will be more fully crowned with glory and honor. They have glory and honor now by virtue of being made in the image of God, by virtue of their status as human beings and what they once were fell from, but then more fully they'll be crowned with glory and honor in the world to come. And when that happens, the psalm says, everything will be put in subjection under their feet, under the feet of human beings. So that's the psalm. Psalm chapter 8 quoted here about humans in general. Then the author begins to explain and apply that to his purpose in relationship to Jesus and angels and human beings in what follows here in Hebrews chapter 2. And he, he begins that by clarifying that Subjecting all things under his feet actually means all things. And so he says in the next verse, For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subjected to him. And so with this sentence, he begins to explain and apply Psalm 8 to his audience. And he does so by saying, All things means all things. But that's where the problem lies, at least right now. So he says, But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. So in the present time, in the present world, we don't see it yet. We don't see humans crowned with glory and honor and reigning over all things. But what do we see? Well, that's where he heads in verse 9. And he says, what we do see is we see the Son taking on the role of the representative human for all other human beings so that he might deal with sin and death for everyone. And that's what led to his exaltation. So here's how he says it in verses 9 and following. He says, but 
we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of his suffering, death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. You can see here in this verse, Two lines of Psalm 8 now apply to the unique experience of Jesus. You see his incarnation and death being made for a little while lower than the angels. And it's at this point in Hebrews we actually get the name Jesus being used for the first time because we're talking about the Son become human, Jesus. But we also see here another line from Psalm 8, being crowned with glory and honor, Jesus' exaltation as explained in Hebrews chapter 1. And notice the way that the author of Hebrews connects Jesus' death to his exaltation. It's not a loose connection. Notice what he says here. He says, because of his suffering death crowned with glory and honor. His death was the basis for his exaltation. So instead of denying his glory, Jesus' suffering death is the reason for his exaltation. And the Bible consistently teaches that Christ's death, which would naturally seem to be the epitome of failure and defeat, was actually turned into an expression of power and dominion through the resurrection. You find this, for example, in Acts chapter 2, the first Christian sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, where he says this, God made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Or again, in Acts chapter 4, God raised him up and made him the cornerstone. Or Acts chapter 5, you put him to death, but God exalted him to his right hand. Over and over again, we see this where Jesus' death is the basis for his exaltation. One of the most beautiful places it shows up in the New Testament is Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. And so, while maybe to... Those from the outside looking at Jesus, it looks like, see, he's just weak and he's lowly and he's powerless and he's shameful and he died an awful, disgraceful death. To those who have eyes of faith, they realize, no, that's the basis for his exaltation. And so what the author of Hebrews wants us to see and what his original audience to see is that Jesus' humanity and his suffering and his disgraceful death don't negate his glory and his exaltation. They lead to it. They're the reason for it. And notice how verse 9 ends. It ends by saying, really giving a purpose or a result clause of this. So he, made, he was made lower than the angels for a little while, incarnation, crowned with glory and honor, exaltation, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. That's really why he had to come and why he had to die, so that as an expression of the grace of God, the undeserved favor of God, the love that stoops down to help those who can't help themselves, that's the idea of grace, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. That's why he had to die, was for the sake of everyone. And that phrase, taste death, that doesn't mean that he just got a little bit of death. That's a Hebrew idiom for experiencing something completely or fully. And so you see this when Jesus is actually using the same imagery, talking about his death, where he says that, uh, can you drink the cup that I drink? Or when he's uh, praying in the garden, let this cup pass from me. This is the same sort of imagery where we're drinking a cup or we're tasting death. It's to experiencing something to the fullest. And so he fully experienced death for everyone. Then the author of Hebrews goes on in verse 10 to explain this further. He says, for it was fitting for him that him there refers to God. So it was fitting for him, for God, for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the originator of their salvation through sufferings. Let's just clarify a few things. And first off, just what almost feels like a passing phrase describing God as the one for whom are all things and through whom are all things. Those kinds of phrases are easy just to walk over real quick when we're reading scripture, but think of what that says about God. It was fitting for God, and God's the one for whom all things exist. Everything exists for him. 
And he's also the one through whom all things exist. He's the originator, the creator of all things. That's who God is. And so it was fitting for God, for whom are all things and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory. Many sons here refers to God's children, sons and daughters. So in bringing um, many human beings, sons and daughters, to glory. Uh, in Psalm 8, which he just quoted, glory refers to the status and role that human beings were supposed to have as God's co-regents over the world. They were crowned with glory and honor. It is thus the position that was somewhat corrupted and lost in the fall. We fell short of the glory of God, Romans chapter 3. But that's also the destiny to which we're returning by uh, means of the work of Jesus. And so it's the glory of a world full of the presence of God and humans living in full partnership with him, living out their roles and kings as kings and queens over God's world. So in bringing human beings back into his family and leading them to this glory that's destined for them, the author of Hebrews says it was fitting to do that through the sufferings of the originator of their salvation. The term originator, uh, some translations have pioneer. Uh, the Greek word is actually used only four times in the New Testament. It always refers to Jesus, as particularly in reference to his death, resurrection, and exaltation. The basic meaning is the idea of like founder and leader. F.F. Bruce, one commentator on Hebrews, says it's like Jesus blazed the trail of salvation. That's the idea. And so in blazing that trail of salvation, in, in Jesus being the founder and leader of the salvation of human beings, it was fitting, it was right, it was appropriate to perfect him, to bring him to full completion through sufferings. Indeed, Jesus' sufferings don't contradict his glory or his achievement. It was how he was glorified. It was how he was completed and fulfilled his mission and his task. Then the author goes on to comment on the many sons, showing how fully and completely Jesus has identified with them and their humanness. So verse 11 says this, For both he who sanctifies... And those who are sanctified are all from one Father. For this reason, he is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, and then he's going to go on and quote some Old Testament texts. Uh, but notice what he says here. This is really about commenting on those many sons in the preceding verse, the many sons that are being led to glory. How fully does Jesus identify with them? Well, he calls them brothers and sisters. That's the point here of verse 11. So just to clarify... The one who sanctifies, that's Jesus. And the word sanctify basically means to set apart for God, to make people holy. Uh, the author of Hebrews will actually develop the idea of Jesus being the sanctifier of people in chapters 9 and 10. And we'll see there that for him, it's connected to establishing the new covenant by means of Jesus' death. So Jesus is the one who sanctifies people. And then those who are sanctified, that's human beings. So humans are the ones who are set apart for God and made holy. And notice what he says, both are from one. And this translation has supplied the word father. All, both are from one father. But that word father isn't in the original text. It's just both are from one. The idea is they're from one source. They're, from, they're part of one family. Hence the reason they've supplied the word father. And so Jesus and humans... Uh, both are one. So Jesus has become so much like us that he is now our brother and he isn't ashamed to call us that. Uh, there's no disgrace for Jesus in saying brother or sister to his fellow human beings who are part of his new family. So whatever the world around you thinks of your allegiance to Jesus, Jesus isn't ashamed of you, right? That's the idea. And for the original readers who are being tempted to go back to Judaism to avoid the shame and disgrace of following Jesus, he's like, hold on. The glorious, exalted son has so identified with you, he calls you brother and sister. That's the point. Then the author goes on to show Jesus' brotherhood with people, his solidarity, if you will, with them from three Old Testament quotes. Notice he ends that uh, opening line there in verse 11 and verse 12 by saying, and he, he's going to quote some Old Testament texts and put them into the, the mouth of Jesus. This is how Jesus identifies or shows his solidarity with people. So he says, 
I will proclaim your name to my brothers. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing your praise. This is words from Psalm 22. It's Psalm 22, verse 22. Psalm 22 is the psalm that opens with the line that Jesus quoted while hanging on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so it was originally about a righteous sufferer in its original context, but Jesus took it upon himself on the cross because he is the ultimate and unique righteous sufferer. And the details, at least some of the details in Psalm 22, uniquely fit Jesus on the cross. And so it finds its fulfillment in Christ and was routinely applied to his suffering in the New Testament. And so he is the speaker here in the psalm. And the point here is, notice, I will proclaim your name to my brothers. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing your praise. And so the assembly of my brothers, the assembly of my people, right? And the word assembly is the word routinely translated church in the New Testament, but it means an assembly of people. So here's the assembly of God's people and Jesus calling them his brothers and saying, I'm going to proclaim God's name and sing his praise here among my brothers and sisters in the new family of God. Then the author of Hebrews quotes two more passages, both which appear to come from Isaiah chapter 8. In their original context, they were about Isaiah. So there's a little bit of challenge grasping exactly how they connect to Christ. I'm sure if we could sit down with the author of Hebrews, he would make it pretty clear to us how he saw the connection, but we have to wrestle with it just a little bit. So here's the quotes, verse 13. And again, here's another quote, in other words, I will put my trust in him. This passage is vague enough that it could possibly come from a couple different places in the Old Testament. But since the next quote is from uh, Isaiah 8, 18. This one is probably best viewed as coming from Isaiah 8, 17. And in its original context, Isaiah is pledging to wait on the Lord and trust in him until the Lord's word is fulfilled. Then the very next line in Isaiah 8 is the one that gets quoted in the second half of verse 13. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given to me. Now, again, in Isaiah 8, this is about Isaiah and Isaiah's children who were given to him. But here's the thing. Isaiah's children were not just like the typical uh, Jewish child in the 700s B.C. Isaiah's children were given specifically to be signs that the Lord was going to keep his word. That's why God told them what to name them, and their names are unique. They point to things that the Lord is going to do in fulfillment of his promises to Israel. So Isaiah's children were living, breathing pictures of the faithful remnant that God would preserve and save. Now, how do those two passages then from Isaiah fit in here? Well, it seems that in view of the uh, entire original context of Isaiah 8, particularly Isaiah 7, 8, and 9, the author of Hebrews does what Jewish interpreters regularly did take the point of the original passage and apply it to its ultimate fulfillment in the Messiah Jesus. So Isaiah chapter 7, that's the passage where you you get the prophecy of the virgin birth and the coming of Emmanuel that the apostle Matthew quotes at the beginning of his gospel. In Isaiah chapter 9, that's the prophecy of Messiah, Messiah that's often quoted at Christmas time about the coming one who will be Almighty God, Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, and all of that that's routinely applied to Jesus as well. In the middle of those two chapters, you get chapter 8, which includes two references to Emmanuel in chapter 8, 8 and verse 10 of chapter 8. And so the authors of the New Testament regularly recognize that what God was telling Isaiah to do and what Isaiah was writing about pointed beyond Isaiah himself, beyond Isaiah's own family, to a more complete fulfillment in the ultimate Emmanuel and in uh, the ultimate faithful remnant of God's people that would, that would come in and through the Messiah. And so these passages all point to Jesus. And in context here in Hebrews, what he wants to say is, and they do so by showing Jesus's solidarity with his people. There's brothers and sisters. They're all the faithful remnant who are now children of God. And then in the following verses, playing off of the word children in that last Old Testament quote from Isaiah 8, the author of Hebrews explains what all this means then for Jesus. So look at verse 14. Therefore, 
since the children, you hear the connection with Isaiah 8.18 that was just quoted, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. He also took on flesh and blood. He became human as well. Since the children of God, since the, the faithful remnant were human beings, he became human. Um, and remember that the author of Hebrews is applying Psalm 8 to Jesus and explaining why he became human and thus lower for a time than the angels and why he had to die. Well, it's because he was, he was dealing with human beings. He was working to help and rescue human beings. And so since uh, the children share in flesh and blood, he partook of the same. He became a human so that, here's the purpose, so that through death, he had to become human so that he could die, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. And so here we see one of the key effects of Jesus' death. It defeated the devil. In fact, it's translated here, destroy. Some translations have render powerless, and that's probably a better idea. The Greek word here has the idea of render powerless or render inoperative, to nullify something's power. Um, elsewhere in the New Testament, this is pictured as Jesus taking the keys of death and Hades away from the devil. The devil is no longer in charge. Death is a defeated enemy, and so is the devil. And that leads then to the second part of Jesus' victory through his death. And, and so it's not just that he might render powerless the devil who had the power of death, but verse 15, and he might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. Notice that it's the fear of death, not death itself here, although death itself is underlying. People have always had some sort of fear of death, at least to some extent and in varying degrees and varying amounts in various places. And in, in general, they seek to avoid it. They, they don't want to die. But Jesus gave death home field advantage and still defeated it. And now those with him know that death has lost. Death is not victorious. And so they no longer have to live in fear of death for the rest of their lives. That's the point. And so Jesus partook of human nature, flesh and blood, so that he would die, so that through his death he could render powerless uh, the devil who had the power of death. So take, take that back from the devil and there, therefore free people, his people, from the fear of death and the slavery it brought. So that's really one of the key points the author of Hebrews wants to make in this whole section, helping us see why Jesus became human, why he had to suffer and die. Then in verse 16, the author kind of gives a bit of an aside to restate that it's humans that Jesus identifies with, and it's humans that Jesus rescues, not angels. So verse 16, a little bit of a parenthesis, he says, for clearly he doesn't give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham, to the seed of Abraham. And so, as I noted, this is a kind of a parenthetical note to emphasize that Jesus did this for human beings, the descendants of Abraham, that is the seed of Abraham. In fact, according to the rest of the New Testament, the seed of Abraham includes all those who are in Christ, whether Jew or Gentile, right? So he did this for human beings who become a part of his family. That's the point of the aside, just to kind of emphasize this in relationship to angels. Now, the author then gets ready to tie all of this together to make his final conclusion in the last couple verses of chapter 2. He says in verse 17, Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brothers. Notice that, that he had to become like his brothers, his, his brothers who are human. So he had to become like them in all things. That is fully human. And notice he had to do it. That is, it was necessary. So he had to be made like his brothers in everything so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God. And so in order for him to actually be a merciful and faithful high priest, he had to become 100% fully human. That's the point verse 17 is making. And being a merciful and faithful high priest entails making propitiation for the sins of the people. That's the way verse 17 ends, in order to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Um, and that was the role of the high priest, even under the old covenant. His job every year on the Day of the Atonement was to make atonement. 
That is, he would offer the, the appropriate offering, uh, take the blood into the most holy place, sprinkle the blood on the atonement cover on top of the Ark of the Covenant so that God's punishment, his wrath, could be turned away from the people. That's what the Day of Atonement is all about. The author of Hebrews is actually going to explain all of that in more detail in chapters 9 and 10. So this sort of points us forward to that moment when we'll get more of that. But that's what's entailed in being a high priest. And so Jesus had to become fully human so that he could be a merciful and faithful high priest so that he could make propitiation for the sins of the people, so that he could deal with sin, make atonement, and turn away God's just repayment, his wrath, from the sins of the people. And in fact, it was his identity with us as human beings that made all of this possible. So look at verse 18, 4, explaining this. Since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered. And so notice that we watched this happen in the Gospels with Jesus. His suffering, uh, all of his suffering, but the culmination of which was his death, there was a test involved in that, right? He didn't want to go through with it. Would he obey the Father's will? Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, your will. And the basic idea of the word tempted is test or testing. And so there are external tests that come in the form of Things suffer from the outside that they test our loyalty and faithfulness to God. And there are internal tests, what we usually call temptations, where we're tempted to do something wrong and they test our loyalty to God. That's the basic idea of the word tempted here. And so the idea is is that Jesus' suffering, and particularly his suffering and his death, tested his loyalty to God. And insofar as that was the case, he verse 18, the second half, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted in both senses. They are tempted externally by hardship and difficulty and suffering. Will they be loyal to to God through that? They are tested internally through temptation and through their own sinful desires. Will they be faithful to God in the midst of that? Well, Jesus is able to come to the aid of human beings who experience both forms of tests to their loyalty to God because he himself has been there and done that, defeated it, and offered himself up in complete ultimate faithfulness by his death to come to the aid of human beings. And so to summarize the big idea of this section, if Jesus is so glorious and exalted as chapter 1 says, why does he look so lowly, weak, and humble when you watch his life? And the answer is, well, he was made a little lower than the angels for a time being because he needed to do that to identify with human beings so that he could rescue them from sin and death. The son became human so that he could die, so that humans could be led to glory. That's what this section of Hebrews is all about. Thanks for tuning in to this session of the Listener's Commentary on the New Testament. The Listener's Commentary is a listener-supported, crowdfunded Bible teaching ministry made possible by the generosity of folks just like you. So thanks a ton for your support. And if you want to join the team of supporters, you can do so by going to listenerscommentary.com, clicking the Give button, and setting up a donation right there. Thanks a ton for your support.